Rob Ospero here. Be sure to check out VolleyballMag.com, powered by P1440, for all the latest news, schedules, and updates in NCAA Division I to men's volleyball. Also, be sure to follow them on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. That's all the hottest men's volleyball news over at VolleyballMag.com, powered by P1440. All right, we're on episode seven of College Volleyball Weekly. It has been a one chaotic week in college volleyball on the men's side. On the screen, we have our consortium of coaching intelligence. That's Dan Friend, head coach at Lewis University. Jay Hosick, head coach of George Mason University. Looking for an infirmary of a university currently, but we'll talk about that as we get into our topics. All I got to say is thank God you two are here because you bring the consortium of coaching intelligence way up from where I am. So appreciate it. <laughs> well, as I mentioned, uh, as we started off our show, first topic of the week is a week of five setters and upsets. Uh, let's go with the uh, MEVA conference, Dan. Pick one that you saw was an upset because I, I know there were four according to my listing. Well, I, I think I would say Quincy over Purdue, Fort Wayne. I, I think that's uh, Quincy's first conference win since uh, I have to go look at it, but I think it's been a few years uh, in terms of that. And so, and uh, pretty big for those guys and winning in five. And uh, they played a great match uh, the night uh, before that against uh, Loyola uh, and had them on the ropes and almost won that at the same time. So I would say that Quincy match for sure. And, they were led by uh, Omar on the uh, the kill side, and d defensively they were led by one of their middles. Adam Meyer had, I think, 10 blocks in their libero. Uh, Gnome uh, Hannon had 14 digs. But I think with them, they've got a couple foreign guys. Gnome's a kid from Israel. He's their libero, and they got a setter. I think it's Yoron Raymakers. Guy's got a great name, Raymakers. Yeah, so. Raymakers. <laughs> he's actually uh, a graduate. Yes. He's actually a graduate student, so he's older. Uh, I think playing his uh, his college volleyball, and so, uh, but, uh, but yeah, Quincy for sure, and then you know Lindenwood getting two straight wins. I think Lindenwood's on a six match win streak, uh, and defeating again Purdue, Fort Wayne, and defeating Loyola, uh, and so I think uh, those were two uh, great wins for that program, and a couple of different guys stepped up in different nights. How about that uh, uh, Ball State McKendry? I, that, that was kind of an unexpected result. Uh, yes and no. I think you got to realize, so McKendry ended Ball State's season last year uh, in the conference tournament. So I think Ball State was licking their chops for those guys coming in. You know, they're like, hey, McKendry's on a high. They just got done beating Lewis. They're coming into our place. We're playing good volleyball. Uh, I think uh, it was great. You know what I mean? I think uh, Ball State was really wanting that uh, win. So, yep, I would agree with that 100%. I think Caleb Jennings led them with 21 kills that night, hitting 370, had a really good night. So, well, and then you got PFW, two losses on the week. Uh, first one to Lindenwood, 3-1, and then to Loyola, 3-2. Uh, Jay, feel free to chime in, unless, Dan, you want to step in and take the, the bull by the horns here. Uh, I'll be quick. You know, I, I think Lindenwood is the hot team at the moment. Uh, and when we get to the matches uh, coming up, they're going to be the team that I'm going to be watching. But, you know, when, when you get a team that all of a sudden finds some confidence and beats a good team and – they go back to their gyms and they figure out, hey, we can actually play at the higher levels and, and be able to compete and, and execute and, and win some of those matches. That's a really dangerous place to be. So anybody playing Linden right, well, Lindenwood right now, you better be really well prepared because they're going to come in with all kinds of guns a-blazing. Yeah, we got them on Saturday! <laughs> <laughs> Watch that game film, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I gotta, I, we got to play Quincy first on Wednesday, so I get a buck. Oh, you know I mean? so. the trap match. That's yeah, eyes on Romeoville, right? Yeah, yeah. Heck, we're better on the road anyway. Can I just go play them in a different gym right now? Shoot. So. Call up the local high school, see if you can get a match in there. Yeah, I'm going to go down to Romeoville, so it'll be great. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to scroll in real quick. I think it's interesting with Purdue. I think uh, you look kind of the stats. They didn't hit great either night outside of Pelegrin. I mean, they're riding Pellegrin, and I think they need some help from some other guys stepping up. And so, uh, otherwise, Pellegrin, he's a phenomenal player, fantastic player, but he might run out of gas. And so, uh, yeah, I think that could be part of it. And it'll be interesting. That I think they're back home this next week, and if they can settle in and get a good groove and get going again. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's uh, shift on over to the EIVA and uh, the match of the week. Uh, you know, you had Harvard for two, Jay. Took them 3-2 on the first night in a very exciting match. 
But then on Saturday night, got turned around on you, and they took it 3-1. Talk about that match. Well, you know, we're we're facing the injury bug this year, and and yet uh, this weekend I faced another starter going down for the year, probably with my libero going out. So, you know, we're we're just we're just going out there and just trying to compete. And you know, we still got some good players on the court, and they're still fighting their asses off, and we still like our chances against everybody. But the reality is, when you don't have big time players that you usually can rely upon, it can become a little bit tough. So hats off to Harvard. I mean, Harvard beat Grand Canyon in the beginning of the year, and they're a good team. They've got a couple of really good young middles. One of them right now is out uh, with an ankle injury, but he'll be back soon. Uh, they got a really good opposite. He's got a live arm. They got a couple outside hitters in Schoenfeld and Lee. Uh, both about six seven or six eight. They pass really well. They hit a really quick ball. Their uh, their setter uh, Stavertlik is running a really fast tempo to the pins. Harvard's a good team. They're going to be a team that I think at the end of the year, they're going to be in the hunt for a playoff spot in the EIVA. We're still the only conference that only takes half of the teams into playoffs. Mm-hmm. Everybody else gets to go in all their playoffs. Yeah. We unfortunately we're fighting for spots that that are becoming tighter and tighter each week. Each week. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, obviously looking at the conference standings, uh, the MIVA still is is a hot mess. And it's odd not seeing Dan Franz Lewis team atop undefeated. It's Lindenwood at 2-0 and on top of that conference. And then uh, for yours, Jay, in the EIVA, you got Penn State as the only undefeated team. So uh, everyone's taking their bumps and bruises early here. So, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. it, it should be a fun uh, week. Uh, in the FCSF, since we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that, obviously BYU stands at the top, but everything else is just going to be an ugly dogfight. Um, you know, some teams are hot, like Grand Canyon are, are teams you got to watch out for. Uh, Concordian has a p- potential. If UCLA figures it out, they're going to be scary good. Um, you know, it, it's Stanford. You know, they find a groove if they can actually keep an uninjured setter. You know, they, they could really step up. And don't forget about and don't forget about the uh, the Big West. You've got a three-headed monster in Hawaii, Long Beach, and uh, uh, Santa Barbara. Those are three teams that are going to be fighting for one spot for sure, and maybe for two. They're not going to get both the at-larges, uh, right. and that's going to be an absolute dogfight. One of those teams. Take this into consideration. One of those teams won't make it to May in Fairfax. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Well. Hey, I was just going to throw in. I thought Penn State made a good statement. I mean, they got two wins in uh, uh, in conference against NJIT and Princeton, and so uh, and certainly important wins when you can get those and and you're starting off conference play for sure. So yeah, yeah good call. Yeah. Um, I, I definitely got to touch on Big West since it is my conference. I was trying to avoid the uh, the shame, but uh, it actually is not very shameful because after watching uh, UC San Diego on the ESPN feeds. And then having them come into the UC Irvine on Saturday night, you know, Kevin Ring has got a great player in Kyle McCauley. Um, a five-set match. It was dramatic. It was a great mano a mano battle between Schneidmiller and McCauley. Um, you know, it was a, an extended third set, 28-26, and the teams are going for it. Ryan Lou, their libero, was playing phenomenally. Um, and, you know, there was a... Is a great night of volleyball, a long night. But when when it came up, uh, when the match was on the line, Kyle McCauley was the guy that was stepping up. Uh, you know, Joel Schneidmiller needed some help from the rest of the team. You know, Static was getting his blocks, but offensively, uh, both sides seemed to be sputtering because I think San Diego hadn't seen a block like Static and Dennis uh, at the pins uh, with uh, Seconda and Camp as well. So. Uh, well, we took a 3-2 loss, and Kyle McCauley was phenomenal in the effort. I'm trying to pull his numbers here, but, you know, he hit well over 300, had double-digit kills, and uh, and he just was playing really good ball. So, uh, hats off to uh, UC San nice. Diego getting their first ever Big West Conference win, by the way. So, nice. That's awesome. Good for Kevin Ring. And, you know, you got to love the guy. He's been there forever and has always dealt with a, a short deck of, of – of cards against everybody else who's got a full deck. Now the guy is starting to compete because he's finally got some cards that he can play with. So super stoked for you, Kevin. Hats off to you, bud. All right, let's yeah. uh, let's go on to our next topic. Only two unbeatens remain. Number one, Hawaii at 14-0. and And number two, BYU at 13-0. and Hawaii had a uh, series against Stanford twice. And uh, Colton Cowell stepped up. Um, 
Talk about the Hawaiian team. Any thoughts? Well, I think you're going into Stanford still trying to figure it out with Justin Liu's setting, and ultimately Hawaii goes in, and Rado has a great night the second night. Colton was good the first night. Wasn't a real high hitting percentage the first night, uh, just in terms of either team. Uh, but I think Hawaii's too formidable. I think, granted, we talked about Justin set last week, and he did a great job, but I just think, you know, going against, you know, one of the best teams in the country, they just got too many weapons, and you know, Stanford's just not in a good enough groove with the, with those pieces right now to compete at that level right now. So it's not shocking that they go in there and get both those wins like that. So yeah, I'd agree. And I think Letsky got the nod the second night to set against uh, yeah. Hawaii. So, so you know, now you got a young guy who's getting in there. Who I, I don't know why he wasn't playing early in the year. Possibly an injury. It's it's been going around a little bit. But um, you know, he he's a freshman. You know, you can't you yeah. can't. You can't knock a kid who's just trying to get in there and get some competing time and then doesn't maybe know how to run an offense quite as savvy as some of the older guys around the country. But, you know, Stanford's going to be good uh, the entire year. As long as they can remain healthy, they're going to figure some things out. You know, the MPSF right now is a jumble of craziness, and everybody can beat everybody. BYU obviously is still the team to beat, but, yeah, I'm with Dan. UCLA at the end of the year is going to be dangerous. Grand Canyon is going to be dangerous. Uh, Stanford's going to be dangerous. You, you never know who's going to beat somebody on any given night. Yeah. Well, just on, on night one of Hawaii Stanford, Rado had 15 kills at 462. Philip Humler, 13 kills at 632. But on the other side, Stanford Jalen Jasper led the way 10 kills, but he hit 097. So uh, I have a thing the Hawaiian block, uh, was it the Manoa Roofing Company was uh, taking charge that night? Uh, <laughs> Let's jump over to BYU. They had Grand Canyon this weekend. There was no Gabby Garcia Fernandez in attendance. Uh, they ended up winning uh, in a sweep. But, you know, Felipe de Brito Ferreira, their middle, goes down in the first set. And uh, due to hopefully not a serious ankle sprain. It looked like an ankle. Uh, but they still handily beat a very hot Grand Canyon team. Uh, any thoughts on the team from either of you? Yeah, I, I didn't get to see that match live. Was that? Do you guys know which arena that was played in? I just saw the stat book and everything afterwards. You know, well, they went played? to the big arena. They went to the big arena on that one. Yeah, I, I just, you know, it's one of those things where I, I thought Grand Canyon would get a game off of him for sure, if not push them, just with you know him being out. And uh, so I was a little surprised with that, but it just shows you some depth that BYU has with some pieces. Do you know what I mean? And so, uh, and they could be messing a guy here or there and have another guy step in and still be. You know, pretty formidable, if not, you know, one of the best teams, if not the best team right now. So yeah, that's that's the the thing I take away from is it just shows the depth of BYU. You know, any team that wins a championship, whether it's conference or national, uh, the the immediate thought process is, yeah, the second place team in the gym uh, that night was the team that lost, but the real second place team is the team they practice against every day. And BYU has got a ginormous roster of a very <laughs> deep amount of players. And Jake, that, that you just, trade that's for some guys. <laughs> Yeah, I'm. I'm actually got a phone uh, call into them right now. I'm hoping I can pull a couple of them up. <laughs> uh, well, uh, you know, I just was following the chat boards, aka Volley Talk, trying to figure out why Gabby wasn't there. <laughs> and uh, it was, you know, people are saying it was just a night off, uh, nothing wrong. So um, maybe just wants to do some load management by uh, Coach Olmstead. So uh, you know, that's an opportunity. You got to remember with that match, though, none of their passing core was out. So the whole passing core is there. The setter's there. So, I mean, when you have that, and I'm not downplaying an opposite, uh, but he makes them that much better on a grind-out match. But my guess is they were just in system. And, you know, you saw, you know, Alex, you know, go in and, you know, have the same time of attempts that Gabby was going to have and play great. You know what I mean? And so, so yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, on the, on that BYU squad, I'm I'm certain that Gabby and Davide have got to hit the hard, one of the hardest balls in the nation. Uh, I haven't seen Penn State in person, but I, I think they got some guys who can load up like uh, Calvin Mendy and then Wildman with a name like that. If he hits a hard ball, that's awesome publicity. So, uh, you know, uh, with two guys that can load up like that at, at your pins, you know, BYU is looking really strong. And they had a guy Alex Asu who stepped in for. Uh, Gabby to play opposite at night, and he did really well. Yeah. So, uh, you know, BYU, talent and depth is a good combination, especially in a long season. Which brings us to our setup for March Melee. 
That's number one, Hawaii against number two, BYU in the Stan Sheriff Center. Uh, both teams, I'm assuming, will probably be undefeated. Yeah, I hate that to jinx one team, BYU, but uh, um, I mean, <laughs> no, I'm not jinxing them. I'm just saying that if you look at the other team's records. <laughs> yeah, wow. Uh, you will never be allowed back in the island with that statement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying, it's going to be a formidable matchup because you have obviously the best of the nation that are going head to head. And that could be potentially a national championship match. Uh, you know, with that matchup coming up in March, uh, the schedule for Hawaii, they have two, uh, I guess they're considered exhibition matches against uh, Nitadai, which is also known as the Nippon Sports Science University. They've got two against them BYU has Concordia, USC, and Stanford. Uh, how do you prep for this? You, you've got this looming on the outset as coaching uh, staff. How do you prepare your guys? <laughs> oh, no one wants to take it. <laughs> no, I, I, I'll take it. It's a much different yeah. setup. setup. You, yeah. You Hawaii, who is playing against a, a team that means nothing. And, and I say that with all due respect. I'm sure they're a good team, and I'm sure it's going to be fun volleyball, but there's no pressure for that. You can yeah. play your entire B-side, rest your A-side guys for the entire weekend, and it won't hurt you. Uh, I'm, I'm not so sure how uh, that gets done in the middle of a season, but regardless of that, then you got BYU playing against teams that matter, and that pressure and that added you know, intensity of playing against teams in your conference, that's, that's going to mean something, I think, down the line. And, and I think... You know, Hawaii is not going to – they're not going to struggle because of it. It doesn't mean that they're all of a sudden going to, you know, fall off the face of the earth. But when your matches mean something, there's just a little bit out of pressure and a little bit of added intensity, and I think that they're going to be able to, you know, maybe not gain as much from it as BYU will from their matches coming up. Right. Yeah, I, I think I agree with Jay. I, that, that, that mental edge that you want to keep throughout the year from week to week and a build up. You know, and do they take a little bit of that off? Are they not quite ready as BYU walks in there because BYU had a had a you know conference match? So maybe it doesn't matter at all. Maybe the rest does them good. I don't know, uh, but I certainly think you you want to keep your guys sharp from week to week. And uh, I'm sure Charlie will have his guys prepped and ready to go. And uh, it'll be you know one of the best matches we see this year, hopefully, in terms of that and from two big teams going at it. So, right. Let's shift over to uh, our top performers of the week. Um, let's go with Jay. I think I had Dan go first last time. Uh, pick one or two. Yeah, I'm going to pick two. One of them is going to be a team, though. I'm, I'm giving Lindenwood a nod here as a team. Uh, oh, coming, out, coming out with your first conference win since 2017, beating a, a ranked program in that process. You know, you got to give hats off to the coaching staff at Lindenwood and to the players. Nice job, way to step up. I'm going to go with Dan's guy, Coonan. He uh, he played against Ohio State and Ball State this weekend, obviously, and hit 492 on the weekend, which is ridiculous, averaging 5.1 kills per game. That kid is a beast and is going to make a lot of money playing professionally in the next few years, and he's going to probably get a chance to go at the national team, and the kid's going to make an impact, I think. So uh, hats off to Coonan. Way to go for that weekend. All right, Dan, how about your top performers? All right, I got two. Uh, I got Brett Wildman at Penn State. Man, the guy was steady again as a rock. 17 for 25, hit 560 one night. 17 for 30, hit 433 another night. You know, 18 points and 19.5 points. I mean, you know, ultimately, you know, Penn State's using him where they need to use him, man. He's playing really good volleyball. So, uh, and then I got one more, Kofi, kind of seeing the reemergence of him a little bit. You know, you say with two good wins uh, this past weekend, Hit six identical stat line, 14 for 20, 14 for 20, hit 600 both nights. Uh, had a few, uh, yeah, I had a few blocks uh, the first night, so he ended up with 18.5 points. But uh, I think they were setting him on the outside uh, as well in terms of that. And so I think uh, uh, certainly anchored them in in terms of offensive for, for two good wins for them. All right, great picks. I'm going to just go with one because uh, – Cal McCauley came into my house and, and beat my guys 3-2, but it was an amazing performance. 24 kills, 333 hitting, three aces, two block assists, 10 digs, total of 28 points. But it was the situations in which he delivered. It was when the sets or the match was on the line, he came up big with a dig or a put away, and it was junk that he was getting too because there were some uh, bombs being delivered by Schneidmiller. They were being picked up by Lou, 
and a set would come off the net, they'd be out of system, and Macaulay would just go for it and uh, would get those kills off the block and or just split the seam. So uh, Kyle Macaulay, great effort, and with that gave uh, UCSC their first ever Big West Conference win. So I've got to go with that, and let's shift over into our matches to watch in Week 8. And I know there's a lot who feels like they, they, they can really uh, take charge and lead us in. <laughs> No I, I, I don't know about take charge or lead us in, but I can certainly talk about a few, and certainly our, our conference, you know. So uh, Lindenwood, who's the hot team in conference right now and at the top, is going to play McKendry on Thursday. Uh, and those guys are, I think, a pretty big rival. It's like us and Loyola down the street from each other. You know, McKendry, McKendry's coming off two tough road losses, uh, and they're going to be at home. Lindenwood's got to go to their place. So uh, I certainly think that becomes uh, a pretty big match uh, for both those teams right there. So, uh, And then for me, you know, I, we got our own two matches in my own backyard, so I'm going to put them on there. I got Quincy, who's coming off, you know, two great matches in their uh, uh, first uh, conference win in a while. Uh, and then you got Lindenwood for us, you know, and if they beat McKendry, they'll be seven-match win streak pretty hot coming into our place. And so uh, uh, those would be the matches I'd probably highlight. So, All right. All right, you, Jay. Uh, I got a few here. I'm going to be watching USC Stanford. Uh, USC is really licking their wounds and trying to figure out who they're going to be for the rest of this year. Um, and so Stanford right now, maybe not licking their wounds. Uh, you know, losing to Hawaii is not, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a bad thing. They're obviously a good team. But they're trying to find their setter. And is Litsky going to be the guy? So I want to see USC Stanford. I'm going to be watching uh, Ball State and Purdue Fort Wayne. That's Battle Indiana. Always a good match. It's kind of the equivalent of UCLA USC. Uh, and it's uh, it's just no nothing matters in terms of record. Uh, they're just going to go in there and they're just going to battle hard. And right now, Ball State's on a little bit of a hot streak, and Linden, uh, Purdue Fort Wayne's on a little bit of a down streak. We'll see if they can figure that last one out. And then my last one that I'm going to be watching is Santa Barbara UCLA. Uh, UCLA is uh, back with Kofi, uh, still kind of figuring some lineup stuff out. Santa Barbara had a weekend off, and they're going to be fresh. And I think Santa Barbara is going to give UCLA a run for their money. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning towards Santa Barbara on this one, but that's going to be a really interesting one to watch. Good calls on that one. And that actually was mine also, Jay. Um, uh, but I'm going to go with the other UCSB match when they take on Pepperdine because Pepperdine is second in the MPSF. You see Santa Barbara is coming off a break. Uh, Big West has been pretty uh, idle here because Long Beach State had their alumni match. That was their big uh, action for the week. They take on Westcliff this week. Uh, but still, we have not seen these two teams that are expected to be the top of the Big West. So Santa Barbara goes into action first against uh, the quality appointments of, uh, opponents of UCLA and then Pepperdine. Um, the other match I'm going to watch, and it's not because I'm a homer, is going to be the turnaround match, UC Irvine at UC San Diego. Uh, yeah. Don't know if you guys caught it, but in match in the third set at Irvine with uh, San Diego, uh, Irvine started with uh, Akil Tanikatur at the service line for a middle. Uh, Irvine ran out of middles at the end of the match in that extended due set. And uh, UCSD exploited our lack of middle in a huge way. First, Akil, who stands at 6'1", 6'2", tried to take a couple jumps in the middle, unsuccessful against a hot Kyle McCauley. And then uh, Brian Garcia, who stepped in the set for Patrick Vorenkamp, stepped in the middle, and then he had two outside hitters. Uh, it just didn't fare well for Irvine. So that, that set, I, Irvine served for that set a couple times and ended up losing at 28-26 because I just, I just want to say it must be nice to be able to have subs that you can just you know go in and out whenever you want. I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know what that feels like, so you know. Uh, <laughs> hey, you know the one other match I forgot to throw in there is Ball State at Loyola. I don't think Ball State has won at Loyola in like ten years. Wow. I'm not sure about that, but I know it's been a long time. Uh, and you got a Loyola team who's, you know, ultimately trying to figure it out and a Ball State team uh, who could be pretty formidable. So uh, that'll be an interesting one. I think that's on, I believe, Saturday. So. Well, great. Well, we've got a full week of action. All conferences are in effect. And uh, uh, big thanks to uh, Dan Friend of Lewis University.